Um, thank you for being here this morning. Let's go ahead and approach the Lord in a word of prayer, and then I'll ask everybody to please stand, and in your bulletins, you have the lyrics for From the Inside Out, a song that we haven't sang in a while. I trust that we'll be edified by it. So let's pray, and then stand and sing to the glory of the Lord. Mighty God, we thank you that you brought us to this place this morning, Lord, that we would relish our identity in you, that we would praise you, Lord, for all that you have given to us pertaining to life and godliness, and that we would continue to grow in you, Lord. So we pray that this time would be edifying, encouraging, dare I say exciting, as we cleave to you, Lord. And we trust that you will provide the increase in our understanding of you, in our understanding of the details of your scriptures, as well as our love for you, Lord, and increase in our love for you. So we thank you, we ask that you go before us and receive our time as worship to you. And we ask this in the mighty and glorious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand and join me in singing from the inside out.
seated this morning. As a part of a thinking faith, we're always thinking through our style of worship. So uh, this morning the song may have been a bit different than usual. I had not heard that version before. Uh, however, I pray that we were edified by it. Uh, again, prayerfully it encourages you throughout the day today to be praising the Lord from the inside out. Uh, hopefully the lyrics resonated with you. And I always want to put a G in that word. There's no G in resonated. Um, however, uh, yeah, so I have it spelled strange in my mind. Uh, however, um, I do pray that the, the lyrics spoke to us and that the reason why we lift up these songs first thing on Sunday morning is so that these words, we would find ourselves humming them and speaking, as the Apostle Paul said in Thessalonians, speaking spiritual words, singing spiritual hymns to one another, reminding ourselves of the truth to love the Lord from the inside out. So prayerfully, uh, you're encouraged by that. I want to thank you all again for being here this morning, and I want to direct your attention to the bulletin as I share a couple of announcements with you. You'll notice the first announcement is a, a Blue Point Bible Church Leadership Committee. I had written an update to our leadership committee about two or three weeks ago, and I had requested today to be a day. I wasn't sure if it, it was good for you gentlemen. Uh, so uh, and again, speaking about leadership committee, what we mean here is the deacons and elders. Uh, and. Uh, so we could decide after I'll see everybody in the foyer if today works for you. I have a little printout of some things that I'd like to uh, go over, or we can meet in the foyer and talk about a better day uh, that might work for us this week. So, uh, you know, again, not speaking to a large populace here. Let's not be fooled. Ed, Steve, Brian, I will uh, talk to you uh, at, in the foyer at the end of the service to see if you gentlemen have some time to stay back and talk a little bit. Uh, later on this evening, we will have our time of common prayer at 530. We meet in the fellowship room here at the church. We encourage you to come on out and join with us for a time of prayer. Uh, there's an outline that's usually provided, and we go through different devotions. I also want to encourage those that gather with us, if there's a devotion that's been speaking to you, bring that to the common prayer table that we might be edified as well. Uh, that's the goal of common prayer is to make it something common that we're constantly doing in our lives, constantly bringing, participating in prayer, and constantly bringing our own thoughts to the common prayer table. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, if you're not able to join with us at 5.30 on Sunday evenings, we of course invite you to join us online for a time of common prayer at 10 a.m. every Monday morning. Uh, the, all the information is available for you there in the bulletin. You can find the meeting ID and the call-in number. You can either use the meeting ID to zoom into the session or you can actually just call into the session uh, with that phone number and then put the meeting ID in and uh, you'll be brought in on our session. I thank those of you that are regularly there. I call those my Monday morning prayer warriors, so uh, I'm appreciative of that, and uh, I hope that we will continue to see a growth in our Sunday evening common prayer as well as our Monday morning common prayer. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we will continue the Ray Vanderlaan series. I believe we're still in uh, something of the heart, right? The, the, I, I'm forgetting the exact title. Uh, however, we're dealing with the contrast of Egypt and Hebraic culture, and we're seeing that through Ray Vanderlaan's teachings. We encourage you to join with us a Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We offer a time, of course, of praise and prayer, as well as uh, our study. This coming Thursday, Edward and I are going to co-host Preterist Power Hour, and we have Daniel Rogers joining the show uh, this coming Thursday. So uh, you can listen to that through Facebook, YouTube, uh, but you can also be a part of the session if you so choose. You can zoom in, call into the session, uh, obviously be a part of the conversation with Daniel, and also... Um, ask him questions or anything at the end of his session. What we'll be doing with Daniel is we're going to talk about where he's at in ministry, ultimately go back to his presentation that he did here at the Not One Stone Left conference, and then also hear about some of the things he's been doing since. Uh, as I mentioned on our Preterist Power Hour last week or the week prior, uh, I mentioned that Daniel Rogers continues to put out a lot of great blogs. I want to encourage each of you, labornotinvain.com is the name of his blog. He has a host of different blogs uh, that he's been putting up. One of the great ways to make sure you're getting all of his blogs is to simply go to his website and put in your email, sign up for it, and then you'll receive it in your inbox. I know my email the past two weeks has been filling up with Daniel Rogers' blog, so I want to encourage each of you to be uh, blessed by that as well. Uh, then, as those of you that were participating in our Saturday morning Bible study know that we've uh, decided that until January 8th, uh, yeah, the first Saturday of January, we're going to take a pause from our study, and our goal, starting on sa Saturday, January 8th, is to move past AD 70. Who would have thought you'd hear a preterist church say that? Uh, you know, we're going to move past, uh, let me qualify, a fulfilled eschatology-believing church. Um, not a, we're not a preterist church. But uh, that being said, um, we're going to move past AD 70 in our Bible study. It'll be a great study. We want to encourage you to maybe think through with us. Uh, join us on Saturdays at 9 a.m. starting in January. I, I know you will be blessed by that study. 
that's what I have for our announcements. There's a November church calendar available. I know we're pretty close to the end of the month. Um, so there's, if, you wanted, if you're curious about the next three days or two days left in the month uh, here at Blue Point, of course, you could visit our website. You could visit our calendar. I just told you everything that's about to happen, so you don't really need to worry too much. If you notice in the bulletin here, I bring you into the first week of December. So I told you everything that's going to happen here for the last week. Um, however, uh, next week, we're going to have a new calendar, December calendar. Also, uh, I'll be uh, paying attention to the anniversaries and birthdays that are in our midst uh, during the month of December. So, Kathy, I'll be in touch with you. And I want to thank Rashonda for constantly giving me the reminder. As if Kathy wasn't reminding me enough, now I have Rashonda reminding me. Make sure you get the birthdays and anniversaries. Praise God for people that hold you accountable. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, open up if there's anything that I may have missed or that you'd like to add to our announcements. Uh, this is the time to share. Okay. I'll invite our officiants to come forward and we will collect our morning offering. While our officiants are getting ready, I did want to let everybody know that uh, last year for Operation Christmas Child, we packed 48 boxes. And that was during COVID, so it's understandable that there wasn't as many as years prior. This year, we packed 101 boxes. So I thank all of you for your contribution and glory to God. It's my privilege to go ahead and bring us in on our corporate time of praise and prayer. What I'll do is I'll preface our time. I'll ask everybody first to bow your heads. I'll preface our time. And then after I offer up the preface, I encourage everybody to begin lifting up your praises and prayers as you feel the Lord uh, giving you unction. I also do want to mention, uh, for those of you that might not be as vocal with your prayers on uh, our Sunday mornings, in the front of your pew, you have that prayer sheet there where you can write down your prayers and you can put them, you can either give them to me at the end of the service or be putting them in the, uh, the offering plates. Uh, there's also offering plates up here that you could just drop them in at the end of the service. Uh, the goal is that you would, even if you don't feel inclined to audibly lift up the praises and prayers, that they would still be uh, lifted up corporately. So if you so choose to do that, that's available for you. And also you'll notice that handout in the pew is also, uh, if you have anything you want to share with me, any questions, comments, encouragement, please write that on the discouragement. Uh, you could write that on, on the slip found in the pew there. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and bring us in on our time. Mighty God, Lord, we thank you that your word tells us that the sacrifice that you desire is not a sacrifice that we could put together with our hands or lift up to you through burning fire, but rather, Lord, the sacrifice of praise, hearts that are on fire for you, lifting up praise to your name. So, Lord, we ask that you go before us and receive that sacrifice. We also, Lord, praise you that you hear our prayers, that you are the God of answered prayer. Your word tells us that we are not to be anxious for anything or any of the bad uh, emotions that come with the trials that we might experience in this world. But rather, Lord, we are to press into you. We are to lift up our praises and prayers, uh, trusting and trusting them to you. So we ask that you go before us, that we already know that your spirit already has. You've gone before us, Lord, to bring up those praises and bring up those prayers that we might continue to show you as powerful through our lives. Thank you, Lord. Hear our prayers this morning.
Mighty God, Lord, I want to thank you for a, an inspiring Thanksgiving, a pre-Thanksgiving service that we had here at the church, the opportunity for each of us to be able to lift up our thanks to you, our thanks to one another uh, for this year. Also, Lord, want to thank you for our post-Thanksgiving hike, that as Brian had uh, rightly pointed out there, that we made it there safe, we hiked safe, and we made it home safe. Uh, thank you for uh, your beautiful creation, Lord. I also want to praise you, Lord, that we're in the season of giving. Uh, as we packed our Operation Christmas Child boxes, we pray for Samaritan's Purse and the effort of those boxes bringing joy and bringing the gospel. We also want to thank you for our individual Thanksgiving experiences and uh, thank you for, I know I thank you for our church being able to have a Thanksgiving outreach as we were able to provide seven people with plates of uh, Thanksgiving food. And Lord, of course, we pray that you would continue to lead us in this season of giving toward other opportunities where we might serve uh, those around us. I want to thank you, Lord, for uh, our church leadership. And uh, while we're not bursting at the seams with growth, we do see new faces and have new people to fellowship with from time to time. So we just continue to praise you for that, all the while praying for continued healthy church leadership and healthy church growth. May we be burdened and inspired by your truth and what we have here, Lord, at Blue Point, that we might spread it and share it with others. I do lift up some specific prayers this morning, uh, thinking of my mother, who unfortunately sustained some burns during Thanksgiving. I pray that you continue to bring her through, uh, and as she goes to the burn unit this morning, that you bring forth, or tomorrow morning, uh, you bring forth healing in her life and in, for her arms. I pray for my younger brother, Eric, who has not been feeling well. I pray that you bring forth healing for him. Praying for Caden, who wasn't feeling well uh, this uh, morning as well. Uh, prayers that you would bring him through. Prayers for Sister Karen, as she's not here in our assembly. Uh, Lord, you know her heart and her mind. We pray that you give her strength. And also, we haven't seen Wayne and Terry in a while, so I want to lift them up in prayer, uh, knowing that they're in Florida, and uh, just pray that you continue to be with them. They expressed having a good time down there, and of course, that you bring them home safely and excited to worship with their church family. And lastly, Lord, I'd like to make mention of 2022. We are getting close to the end of the year. I want to pray over our goals corporately as well as individually. I want to pray over our expectations corporately as well as individually and our desires. As you know, each of us have them corporately and individually. So, Lord, we lift up all these things that I've said, all the things each person here in this congregation has said, as well as those things that each of us might be saying in our hearts and our minds, knowing that you indeed are far above the words that we express with our mouths, we know that you hear them, Lord. Prayers that have been spoken as well as unspoken prayers, and we entrust them to you as the mighty and sovereign God that you are. And we lift all these things up in and through the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for praying with me this morning. At this time, I'm going to uh, bring us in on our responsive reading. I'm noticing Sister Lisa is not here. Um, I had not coordinated with anybody to do responsive reading. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at Isaiah chapter, I'm sorry, Psalm chapter 65. And if I could ask you to stand. Psalm chapter 65, and we're going to read verses 1 through 13, the full chapter. And I'll read the odd numbers, starting with verse 1. I'll ask the congregation to read the even numbers, and we'll end together at verse 13. This is a text entitled in the NASB Bible, God's Abundant Favor to Earth and Man. May it inspire us to praise him for his favor. There will be silence before you, and praise in Zion, O God. And to you, the vow will be performed. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, you forgive them. By awesome deeds you answer us in righteousness, O God of our salvation. You who are the trust of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest sea. who stills the roaring of the seas and the roaring of their waves and the tumult of the peoples. Yeah. 
You visit the earth and cause it to overflow. You greatly enrich it. The stream of God is full of water. You prepare their grain, for thus you prepare the earth. You have crowned the year with your bounty, and your paths drip with fatness. The meadows are clothed with flocks, and the valleys are covered with grain. They shout for joy. Yes, they sing. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Obviously, uh, those of you that were a part of our adult Sunday school, you read this psalm and you said, I know exactly where he's going. Uh, verse 4 stands out to me, of course. This is a text that I've been bringing up a lot lately. How blessed is the one whom you, God, choose to bring near to your courts. In other words, the reason why we dwell in his presence is because he chose and brought us near. Praise be to God. That's God's favor. If you notice through this psalm, and hopefully you did, it's all about what he does. It's all about his good works. In our adult Sunday school this morning, we read through Isaiah chapter 29. And as Isaiah, in Isaiah 29, sure enough, the hope of the nations, the hope of Israel was what? That God would bring forth the marvelous work of his hands. And when he did that, he would restore the people to where they needed to be. He would bring forth the healing of the nations. Or, as this psalm says, if you notice, I loved, uh, if you look at verse 9 through 13, almost every one of them begins with you, 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 just in case we forgot what we're doing here. Just in case we thought that this was about us that we brought ourselves here, these smart, kind, good people, that we brought ourselves here. Actually, let me, let me say it appropriately. Smart, kind, good, and reasonable is the way Luke 8 says it. No, that's not the way. That's not the case. We're here because he brought us here. We're here because of him and his work. And sure enough, if you notice in the last two verses, last three, it says, you have crowned the year with your bounty and your paths drip with fatness. In other words, just like... Deacon Brian had mentioned there that the Lord has brought, given us so much to be thankful for, so much to be grateful for. His paths truly do drip with fatness. But again, it's his work. And if you notice, he has crowned the year with his bounty, meaning, unfortunately, those trials, those tribulations, those blessings, all of it comes from the Lord. All of it is what the Lord has saw fit to bring into our lives. And sure enough, it continues, the pastures of the wilderness drip and the hills gird themselves with rejoicing. The meadows are clothed with flocks, and the valleys are covered with grain. Again, this is all beautiful news to ancient people. You mean the flocks are abundant, the, you know, the hills are rejoicing, uh, the, 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 the grain is, is coming up from the ground. We're going to eat well this year. This is a praise because of his work, what he has done. Now, again, there's a very agricultural example there, but hopefully we all know the agricultural examples of sheep, which I'm going to be leading in on this morning, uh, agricultural uh, uh, details of fruit are oftentimes pointing us to the details of our salvation. You know, again, it's great to praise God for the things in the physical world, but really all of this is bringing us to what you see happening in the physical world is because of what he's doing in the unseen world. So I just wanted to encourage us in regards to his sovereignty this morning, that it all happens because of him. And it's his favor that we see the mountains drip. Any good things that we have, all good things that we have, Come from him, the father of good things. Amen. Just wanted to encourage us with that word this morning. And I uh, want to go ahead and open up. If anybody has an exhortation that they'd like to come forward and share. I think I was going to complete it with I'll get out of your way. Good morning. <clears throat> I find it fitting, you know, to... Uh, share some Bible verses about Thanksgiving. And it's interesting that Pastor had mentioned that as far as sacrifices are concerned, the one sacrifice that will continue through eternity is the sacrifice of Thanksgiving, of, of giving God uh, worship and praise through the fruits of our lips. Uh, so I'm going to give you some Bible verses regarding uh, Thanksgiving. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all situations, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Psalms 103, 1 through 4. Praise the Lord, my soul, all, all my 
inmost being, praise his holy name, praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Colossians 2, 6 through 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving, Isaiah 12, 4 through 5. And on that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known throughout the earth. James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. First Chronicles 16.34. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Hebrews 12.28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Psalms 95, 1 through 5. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms, for the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth, the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the day, the dry land. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let our gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Psalms 118.24. This is the, door, the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Colossians 3.15-17. through 17. Let the peace of Christ Rule in your heart, since as members of the body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. First Chronicles 29, 13. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Uh, Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. But we fill, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to our God and, fa and Father. And finally, Psalms 107, 1 through 3. O oh God, thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, and from the north and from the south. Hebrews 13, 15. Through Jesus, Therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of, our, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Psalms 119, 1 through 8. Blessed are those who, who, whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed is those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do, not, they do no wrong but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are not to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways are steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would 
Do not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. 2 Corinthians 9.15 Thanks be to God for his indescribable gifts. Thank you. thank the Lord for giving me this song. It's a song that really has a lot of meaning for me, and I pray that uh, it'll touch your hearts too, especially as we put Thanksgiving behind us and start looking forward to Christmas. And as I thought, the CD player timed out. Just
Okay. So I have three things to tell you this morning. If you'll notice, that's the name of the bulletin, uh, the name of the sermon in your bulletin. So the first thing, and I want to just let you know, uh, normally we put the verses on the back of the bulletins and things like that. That will continue. I haven't forgotten about that. It's just the last couple weeks have been a little bit out of the ordinary with, obviously, Elder Steve gave the word a couple weeks ago. Then last week was more of a service type of uh, worship service. And then today I'm taking the opportunity to just share, share some things, three things that I want to tell you. And then next week, you'll see as I move into the sermon. So first thing, have you ever had one of those days where you just can't seem to get your thoughts right? Maybe you're in a conversation with someone or in a group of, or with a group of people, or maybe even a Bible study that we have here at the church. And when you get your moment to speak, nothing comes out the way that it was formulating in your head. Well, Sunday, November 7th, about three Sundays ago, was like that for me. I had all this stuff going on up here, but I just couldn't get it out the way that it was going on up there. Hopefully, as most of you know, I take the responsibility and privilege of standing in the pulpit on Sunday mornings rather serious, as I should. I have shared with a few of you how I still enter the pulpit with quote-unquote weakness and trembling, which the Apostle Paul said he speaks with weakness and trembling in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. So I'm in good company. J.D. Greer, pastor and former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, I believe he said it best. No pastor who truly understand the go understands the gospel thinks he deserves to stand in the pulpit. Amen. After all, as one writer put it, what we need in the pulpit are men of, uh, men of God who bring the atmosphere of heaven with them to the pulpit and speak from the borders of another world. Pretty powerful calling. What I'm talking to you about this morning is often referred to as theology of the pulpit or pulpit theology. Uh, theology is the study of God, the knowledge of God. Then theology of the pulpit is how the study or the knowledge of God affects our understanding of the pulpit. So it's with that in mind, the theology of the pulpit, that I endeavor to seek, search, study, and prove the things of God to the best of my ability and walk worthy of my calling, all led by the Spirit, of course, because otherwise it would be persuasive words and man's wisdom if it was not by the Spirit doing what happens in the pulpit. It's with that in mind, oops, I said that, uh, Instead of man's wisdom and persuasive speech, I desire to bring things forth in, in my, my studies and the way that they form in my head with clarity, with simplicity. Matter of fact, it was Albert Einstein who once said, if you cannot explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. And let me be the one to say, how dare a man of God enter the pulpit with unprepared thoughts or thoughts that he doesn't understand well enough to explain to others? I hope you agree with me. I'm sure you do. So taking your minds back to November 7th, the sermon was entitled, Possessing and Increasing the Sheep's Coat. I explained that a sheep's coat is another way of saying a herd of sheep or a sheep's pen. It's where it's the gathering of the sheep. So technically, we are Christ's sheep's coat. I quoted Jesus Christ in saying, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. That's Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Many times in scripture we see Christ referring to his people as sheep. So then he refers to the wolves as those that are going to come against the sheep. And I think that it would be safe to say that we'd all clarify the wolves as the world. Right? Those that are outside of the things of God. Outside of the people of God. So the point when I preached this sermon, uh, possessing and increasing the sheep's coat, the point I wanted us to ponder was what exactly do the sheep do that garners the attention and the ravenous desire of the wolves. I explained that it is not that they are natural enemies, as going after sheep, uh, sheep are oftentimes kept in pens that are fairly close to human population. There's so many other animals that you could get in the wilderness that are not close to human population. Those would be the natural adversaries because they're, they don't require them going near, the, near people, which again, wolves don't seem to like to do. So, is it what the sheep look like? If it's not that they're just natural enemies, then is it that the wolves just seem to really like that wolf? And they just, they, they want, you know, those sheep look so good that they go and attack them. I, I don't think so, no. Is it the noise they make? 
is that, I'm not doing it, but uh, is that noise that they make what, uh, you know, calls the wolves? Maybe sometimes. But I don't know that that's what attracts the wolves, is the, the noise the sheep are making. To sum up my point, I'd venture to say no to both of those assertions. It's not what the sheep look like. It's not how the sheep sound. It's obviously not where the sheep are located that makes it convenient to get them. So then what is it that would cause Christ to say, I send you out as sheep among wolves? The sheep gaining the attention and desire of the wolves, how, well, how do they do it? They gain the desire of the wolves simply by possessing, meaning existing. Simply by existing where they exist and being sheep, the wolves are attracted to them and they want to come get them. And then they increase, right? So that as the sheep are there in this pen, where the wolf looks and sees the pen, he says, I'm going to get, and then all of a sudden, imagine the flock continues to grow. It's safe to say that a wolf is going to want to go by that sheep's pen and attack that sheep's cage because they possess the sheep's pen and they increase. So it's, well, that sheep looks good. I want to go get it. There's a whole bunch of them there, and now there's even more. They're getting bigger and bigger. That's what gets the wolves. That's what causes the wolves to attack the sheep when the sheep possess and increase their pen. And I believe that that's what we, the people of God, are called to do. So when Jesus sends his church out into the world to be in the midst of wolves, I don't believe what he was saying is, I want you to yell so loud and, and be argumentative with the wolves so much that you cause them to attack you. No. I don't want you to dress a certain way that it causes the wolves to be attracted to you. No. What I want you to do is go out, possess and increase in the things that I have blessed you with, and that unfortunately will cause the wolves to look toward you. So I wrote out some thoughts regarding possessing and increasing when I left that sermon. And I want to uh, share them with you because I believe they make the point that I'm trying to make here. I want to bring your mind to 2 Peter chapter 1. Now we all know it, right? If you possess and increase in these eight or nine attributes, I'm summing it up, you will be effective and fruitful in the use of the knowledge of God. If you make your salvation about grace and the purpose of God and nothing else, you may be persecuted by those who want to add something else. If you possess an increase in faith that demonstrates prepared works through you, you may be persecuted by those who want their works to count. If you possess an increase in goodness, you may be persecuted by those who want to see and do bad things. If you possess an increase in knowledge, now hopefully you're going to notice the next couple I'm going to mention are those things that are mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 1. Goodness was one of them, by the way, moral virtue, or moral goodness or virtue. The second one was knowledge. If you possess an increase in knowledge, you may be persecuted by those who lack knowledge or have a zeal for God that is not based upon knowledge. If you possess an increase in self-control, you may be persecuted by those who want to live in excess or without restraint. If you possess an increase in perseverance, you may be persecuted by those who want you to fail or who have quit themselves. If you possess an increase in godliness, you may be persecuted by those who possess a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. If you possess an increase in mutual affection, you might be persecuted by those who live to tear others down. If you possess an increase in love, you might be persecuted by those who don't know God and therefore don't know God because God is love. That's what we are called to do. I believe it is that exact sentiment that I just shared with you, which is what Jesus was thinking when he says, I send you out as sheep among wolves. And, and I, I want to, again, the, on November 7th when I preached this, I preached this as an indictment against the church. Because I think we oftentimes think the sheep need to scream loud, and that's what's going to get the wolves and get the attention of the world. Or that the sheep need to do something particular to attract the world. The only thing we are called to do is possess an increase in the things that make us effective and fruitful in the use of the knowledge of God. And from that, Jesus sends us as sheep in the midst of wolves. We need to possess an increase in those things. One night, leaving a study, Deacon Ed mentioned a quote by Mother Teresa. Matter of fact, I believe it was me sharing this exact sentiment with you. And Mother Teresa continues to be a witness to the glory of God 
uh, someone I would say that I stand upon her shoulders. Again, we oftentimes talk about it around here. We stand upon the shoulders of giants in bringing glory to God. Let's let Mother Teresa, or as Shane Claiborne, Shane Claiborne calls her, Mother T, um, let's continue to mark her out as a giant. And I want to share with you what she said. So Ed had shared this with me, and he said, uh, it goes along with what Mother Teresa said, do it anyway. Right? Possess and increase, do it anyway. So I went home, and that's the blessing of being a part of a fellowship, right? that you get to share these things, and then that other brother might say, well, wait a minute, i got something to add to that, and, and here we are. Now I get to share it with all of you. Thank you, Ed. Do it anyway. People are often unreasonable, irritable, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfishness, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you, have, the good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have, and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. How beautiful is that? Thank you, Ed. That, that says it all right there. We are called to be a people that do that. And doing that is what causes Jesus to say, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Because they're going to be the people that are going to run against everything that we're possessing and increasing in. That's the way that we find persecution in this world. Not by yelling loud and saying, oh, they're persecuting me. Not by doing certain things with our physical lives and then all of a sudden saying, they're persecuting me. No, by possessing and increasing in the things that will make us effective and fruitful. Yes, we will be persecuted. Yes, the world will hate us. But guess what else? That's how God wins people. So in the same sense, he's sending out us amongst wolves. Some of those wolves are intended to be sheep. Some of those wolves are sheep. They just don't know it yet. They don't know their identity. So we are called, the way that we win the world is through that, through doing what Christ told us to do, to possess and increase the sheep's coat. That was the first thing. Second thing, Mark Batterson, uh, many of you know of the name, uh, pastor of the National Community Church in Washington, D.C., he often says this, change of pace plus change of place equals change of perspective. It's a good one. Change of pace plus change of place equals change of perspective. Now, most of you know that I went through a change of place, a change of pace, and I get to share with you a change of perspective uh, more recently. So I drove back from Michigan. Well, I drove there and drove back 13 hours. True to the Mark Batterson quote, I did a lot of thinking, so I had a lot of perspective shifting. Uh, one thing that came to mind, uh, and now again, what I'm doing is sort of giving you a review of some of my thoughts leaving the debate. The first thing that came to mind, I've shared this with some of you, is that I'm either spirit-filled or I'm completely nutso. And nutso is a quote from Steve Bazin. He talks about everything as being nutso. I think it's a phrase that he uses to, uh, everything he disagrees with is nutso. So as I'm driving in my car, I'm leaving there and I'm praying and I'm thinking, thinking through the things of God, wondering why they're even coming to my mind because I'm a wicked, rebellious man. And I'm saying to myself, man, whatever's going on, I'm either spirit-filled or completely nutso. It's either God working in and through me, speaking to me, helping me, or I have completely lost my mind and something else is going on inside and you folks need to be worried. Hopefully we know that that's not the case. Hopefully you agree with me. Um, but again, so I'm sitting in the car, I'm wondering why am I thinking about God? Why? And you'll understand as I continue here. Why am I thinking about all of this if I'm rebelling? God, am I rebelling against you? Am I leading people astray by not telling them they need to be baptized a certain way at a certain place under a certain preacher? And I sat there and I thought, and I said, man, I must either be spirit-filled or nuts. That's it. I'll add my own words. And I want to let you know, I pray that each of you would be filled with the same conviction. Anybody listening to this, that you would be filled with that same conviction to say, I'm either spirit-filled or I'm completely nuts up. That's it. We need that joy. We need that conviction in the body of Christ. 
On the flip side of that emotion, so here I, I'm driving, I'm, I'm finding joy in that phrase, I'm laughing obviously, going nuts so a couple times, and, and I'm, I'm driving, I'm thinking, I'm praying. Now on the flip side of that emotion, I also cried as I drove. I realized my conviction that there are people that are in bondage to that reality that Steve Bazden is preaching. And worse yet, there's people that are leading other, as Steve Bazden, Steve Bazden is doing, he's leading other people to believe that unless they have a wisdom in and of themselves, unless you become true and reasonable, that you do the right things at the right time, obviously here we're talking about water baptism, the ritual of water baptism, from the right preacher. Let's pray that God sends the right preacher into your life that teaches you the moment that God forgives your sins. So unless you have the, you're true and reasonable in your own mind, unless you've met the right preacher preaching the right thing, doing the water baptism, this ritual water baptism at the right time, and unless that preacher is helping the Holy Spirit help you, that means you're unsaved. And I cry. That's a disastrous gospel. That is a different gospel. As Galatians chapter 1 talks about, if anybody preaches to you a different gospel, that's not a gospel at all. That I needed to become strong enough and smart enough and wise enough to help myself. There's no hope. If that be the case, there's no hope for this world. One conversation that, struck with, uh, that, that stuck with me as I woke up and went about driving home was a man who came over, over to me after the debate. And he did. He prefaced his comment with, I don't want to offend you. Speak freely, you won't offend me. He said, do you pray? I said, yeah, I do. He said, do you pray and ask God for wisdom? I said, I love that text. You know, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who supplies it liberally. Amen, yes, absolutely. He said, if so, before you go to bed tonight, ask God if you're missing something. Or maybe that you're being stubborn against his truth. And I have to say, in the manner, the manner and spirit in which he, told, he said that to me, it softened me, and it caused me to really, you know, if somebody says that to you, that you don't really like their manner or their spirit, you're going to be like, oh. but I didn't have that. I said, you know what, let me really think that through. This man came to me and was humble about his approach. So, God, am I, am I holding back? Am I, you know, uh, as some might say, oh, well, you're a preacher at a Baptist church. I'm sure you can't go in there and start preaching bapti uh, baptismal regeneration for the forgiveness of sins. God, am I doing it for the works of man? Am I doing it for the eyes of man? Why don't I agree with this doctrine? So as I woke up and I drove home pondering that exact thought, saying, God, show me. Am I being unfaithful? Am I not teaching the scriptures correctly? All of a sudden, I came to my own story. I said, well, let, I felt as though the spirit brought me to my own testimony. Michael, how were you saved? Okay, so I sat there and I thought about it. Now, just to be clear to everybody here, I did undergo water baptism, the ritual of water baptism, shortly after I came to look to Christ. Now, many of you know my testimony. I'm not going to go too far into it. However, I had to make an appointment with the Protestant chaplain in Auburn Correctional Facility, where I was at at the time. I had to show up to that appointment. I had to make an appointment. It was usually about two weeks out. That's the only way you can get water baptized in the New York State prison system, is you have to write a letter to the chaplain requesting to be baptized, and then they make an appointment two weeks out. So here's a young man. Okay, Let me go off the notes. Uh, so you have to show up to this appointment two weeks out, and then you have to profess your faith, and then the, pro the, the chaplain will baptize you. I have no idea what denom denomination the preacher that I I didn't even know there were th this many denominations. Uh, again, I'm a gang member that came to Christ. So here I am in prison. I'm learning about the doctrines of atonement and how Jesus died for my sins, which I'm going to get to in a moment. And I'm wrestling with these things. I show up to a chaplain's meeting about two or three weeks after I did, did, you know, went through these these moments in my mind, and I want to be baptized. I want to be faithful to the message of Jesus. I forget the specific questions that were asked that day. I don't know what that man said to me at that baptismal pool. You know, I often know, because obviously I've had the privilege of bapti water baptizing people here, the ritual of water baptism. Uh, and I know what I ask people, and sometimes they're different. You know, to be quite honest with you all, be completely transparent, before baptism, sometimes I go to Google. What do you ask somebody when they're getting into the baptismal? You know, what are other preachers saying? And it's different sometimes. There's different questions, different comments, different things that are said. By the way, there's denominations that believe specific things have to be said over you in that tub or you're not saved. 
Not only do we have the Steve Bazdens who believe you have to believe a certain thing, now you got people saying you have to say certain things. So my point is, is I have no idea when I showed up to this meeting, a young man that was trying to, you know, heed the voice of God and turn my life to the best of my ability, obviously knowing God was doing the turning. And I show up to this meeting, I didn't know what this man asked me. I don't know, you know what? I might have been baptized for the remission of sins for all I know. But I didn't pay attention to what that man said that day. So I sat in my car and I thought, did I ruin my salvation? I ruined my salvation. I don't remember. I don't remember if I was being forgiven at that moment, if I was forgiven before, or if I'm being forgiven today. You can imagine that traumatizing. I'm sitting there saying, what are we doing to the gospel? So a young man, gang member, doing violent things, shows up to a chaplain, gets water baptized. Obviously, 20 years later, I'm being told that wasn't good enough. <laughs> so... You know, and if you know my testimony a bit, I want to get a bit personal here. Um, many of you know that I struggled with the concept of atonement. So oftentimes, uh, the prison evangelist would come over to me and they would say, you need to repent of your sins because Jesus died for you. God loved you so much that he died for you. You need to repent of your sins. And I would always say things like, well, I was taught that if you do me a favor that I didn't ask you to do, that's not a favor. That's you trying to hold me make me guilty for something that you did for me without me asking you to do it. Yeah, my gang actually taught that. that You don't do favors for people that don't ask you to do them. It's not a favor. Obviously, I have some disagreements today. I'm glad I was able to come to an understanding of this. But early on in my Christian walk, this was a problem for me. Atonement. I didn't ask him to do that. Why did Jesus... Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Gang member knows a little bit about Christianity. You know, I've seen the, the cross. I've seen Jesus on the cross. I've seen Jesus off the cross. I've had arguments with people about Jesus on the cross, about Jesus off the cross. I don't know anything about why Jesus needed to die for my sins. So I would ask, not only did I have a problem with you doing a favor for me that I didn't ask you to do, I have another problem. Why does somebody have to die for sins? I don't understand. Your God has this whole plan. That, you know, people have to die for sins. So you couldn't do it any other way. And so began my biblical education on what it meant to the people in that time, in the ancient people. The ancient people were the ones that understood sacrifice and why things needed to die on behalf of other people. And, and again, so what was being taught to me was, no, Michael, you need to understand why Christ needed to die for the sins of his people, Matthew 121. Why did Jesus need to die for the sins of his people? And so began my biblical education. My point in saying all of that is, that's what I was thinking about when I was standing at the baptismal. I was thinking about Jesus dying for my sins. I was thinking about the work of God. I was thinking about all that God did to save this wicked man. And there's preachers out there that'll tell you, that wasn't good enough. Because I wasn't thinking about Mike Niana. I wasn't thinking about me and what I need to say and what this preacher needs to say and all these other things. God's salvation is not good enough for me then. By the way, most of you know that I attribute the fact that I even began to have conversations and rub elbows with Christians about these things as God already working in my life. So I believe God was already doing his plan, putting me right where he wanted me. I actually believe being in that prison was I was right where God wanted me. Get this one. One of those prison evangelist that kept coming over me, annoying me about Jesus being, dying for my sins was my mom's former drug dealer. All of that said, I attribute my salvation, yes, to God and his wonderful work of sovereignty and election. And saying, I want that man. He's mine. The world can't have him. And he called me and he kept me by his irresistible grace. Not any wisdom in and of myself. It wasn't about me being wise and reasonable and making choices. No. It's about God's effectual work. Nor any efforts that I had to do. Nothing. I don't believe, yeah, I, Mike Miano believes in a do-nothing religion. Hold on to that quote. I happen to believe my salvation is and was holy God. It's not a mystery I figured out. It's a mystery he revealed. That's how we read it through scripture. He wasn't hoping that Israel would figure out the mystery. He was revealing a mystery to the people. And 
I believe that's exactly what he did in my life. This debate with Steve Bazin has led me to an even firmer refusal and conviction against believing that we have to have all the right doctrines, all your ducks in a row, so to speak. And that's what salvation is. No. And this pertains to baptism. This pertains to election. So yes, I happen to believe an Arminian can be saved. Go, go figure. Because I don't believe you have to understand all the doctrines of salvation or doctrines of grace. I would even say preterism. Now, hopefully we'd agree there, you know, then we got a whole large world out there that's not saved. But God works beyond what our human minds can comprehend. So yes, there is a component of our personal effort that helps us learn and discern from the Spirit, amen. It's the Spirit that provides we must comply. So it cannot be the things we do, including our study, believe it or not. It cannot be that we study to show ourselves approved that makes us saved, because that's something we do. There's nothing we do that affords or maintains salvation. Instead, as a recent devotional I have been listening to by Mark Batterson, NCC Daily, if anybody would like to listen to it, it made clear our role in salvation is like the surfer's role when surfing. And he made, they made a really interesting point. What surfers do is they go out before they're gonna go on the wave, they look at the patterns of the waves. And then what they do is they set their, their surfboard when they get into the water. It's not them doing anything. It's the wave. It's the rhythm of the wave making the surfer surf. Same thing with grace. Watch the patterns of grace. And that's what happens. It's God's work in our lives. We watch the patterns of grace, and it's the grace that does the work, not us. We need to follow the patterns of grace. Find and follow the patterns of grace. So in regards to the debate, I'll let you know uh, this week I'm going to be making a bunch of resources uh, available. You'll be able to get links to the debate. You'll be able to get reviews that have been put out since the debate. Uh, another review I'm working on is a book review of a book called Baptism, Moving Past the Ritual. Nice topic. Uh, so again, I'll be sharing that, and all of that will be found on my blog site. All you have to do is go to mianogonewild.wordpress.com. You'll see a thing that says Miano Based in Debate. You click on that, it'll have all the links and details and information that will keep you... Uh, Clued in and continuing along this conversation of discerning that your salvation is not of yourself. It's not of something you did. It's not of something a preacher did, but rather wholly of God. Third thing. That was my second thing. The third thing. A few weeks back, we completed reviewing and studying through the Gospel of Mark. So far in the New Testament, we've covered chronologically the writings of Matthew and Mark. As we follow the chronology of the New Testament letters uh, that they were, when they were being written and being delivered we find ourselves moving into the letter to the Galatians. This may cause some of you to ask, well, that's not the next book. First off, hopefully you noticed Matthew and Mark aren't next to each other. So, yeah, well, actually, Matthew and Mark are next to each other. Oh, okay, so anyway, nix that. Um, Matthew, Mark, I was gonna say, not in my Bible, no. Uh, Matthew, Mark, uh, then Luke and John, and then Acts, right, and et cetera. Uh, there's, a, there's a way to do this, by the way. I forget what that's called, but they have like a, little thing that you can memorize and you can remember where all the books are. Some of us, must, my dear Aunt Sally, something or other. Um, anyway, uh, many people ask, well, why would you go from Matthew to Mark to Galatians? And obviously that brings us into, why is our Bible not in chronological order? Why are the New Testament writings specifically not in chronological order? Next week I'm going to bring us into that topic. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Why does your Bible look the way it does? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the New Testament letters. And al also, of course, it's going to give me the opportunity to introduce us to the historical context of the book of Galatians. We're going to start going through the book of Galatians chapter by chapter, point by part, uh, point by point, starting in two weeks. That will be Sunday, December 12th. Uh, my encouragement to you is to start reading through it, thinking through things. Write down your questions about the book of Galatians. And if you have time, send them to me, share them with me. That way, the sermons will be responding to your thoughts your questions, your comments, as well as helping us understand the historical context that the letter had to the churches in Galatia. With that, I pray the three things I told you this morning were encouraging, were edifying, and are exciting to the glory of God. Join me in a moment of prayer. Mighty God, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that your spirit gives each of us things to say and that we would say those things when your spirit gives us unction.
I thank you for these three things you've marked out for me this morning, Lord. And I pray that the congregation here was blessed and that we continue to be edified by the work of your spirit, the studying of your scriptures, and the fellowship with one another. Lord, we lift up our time as glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's just try that a cappella. Okay. Marvelous grace, how thou art in the world. Grace. 